several people had asked me to talk about feline chronic kidney disease. Um, and I think really the interest comes in because obviously it's very common. It's something that we all deal with um, at different levels, be it at referral, first opinion, um, nursing clinics. Um, so it is something that can cover a broad spectrum of um, different people working in practices. It's important to me. Uh, it's, as I've said, incredibly common. Um, in fact, we know that if we look at cats as they age, um, once they get to um, the age of 10, 10% of them are going to suffer from CKD. And once they're over 15, 30% will suffer from CKD. Some people have actually suggested that it's a protective mechanism. It's not a very accepted theory. But if you look at the older cats in the population, the majority of them do have CKD. So they've actually hypothesized that it's a protective thing, that if you develop CKD, you survive. It's probably more likely that they've not got the neoplasias when they're younger and therefore have got to an age where they can get CKD, but certainly it is very common. So I think one thing that people um, particularly struggle with is when we know that a cat has chronic kidney disease as opposed to acute kidney injury. Um, and ideally what we would have is we would have blood tests all the way through the cat's life showing when the renal decline happens. We rarely have that. So we have to go with our gut feeling, if you like, and we base that on the history, physical examination findings, and lab findings if we have them, or things that might suggest that it's a chronic disease process that's going on. We can get particular clinical signs, so um, kidney injury will lead to anorexia and often hypersalivation. We can get tongue tip necrosis and oral ulceration, but we can also get um, poor body condition, poor coat, um, and these sorts of things are going to suggest that it's a more chronic disease process. Um, so if a cat's got small kidneys, um, hard, knobbly kidneys, we're going to think it's more chronic than if they're enlarged and swollen when we think it's more acute often. However, to really know what's going on, we need to know that it's been going on for a duration of time. And the literature varies an awful lot on what duration of time kidney injury needs to have been sustained for to be classified as chronic. The iris staging system says that you need to document the um, levels of azotemia and your USG at least two weeks apart in a stable, well-hydrated patient. But if we actually look at the literature, many things say three months. So if we know that we have had kidney injury going on for at least three months, um, then we can start to say it's chronic. And the reason for that is if you take um, the studies that look at acute kidney injury. There is one study that's it's quite astounding, but it's um, a group of cats that were exposed to ethylene glycol and then were put on to um, dialysis. And they had dialysis for six months before you started to see um, resolution of their azotemias. So we know that there is some ability for the kidney to heal for relatively long periods of time after an acute injury, if everything is right and you're given the chance for that to happen. Um, so that's why some things in literature say three months. So ideally, we're going to base the diagnosis mm. on blood test findings, so azotemia, increased urea, creatinine, coupled with our urinalysis. Obviously, you can have an increase in urea creatinine and it be pre-renal, so we need to know that you have a lack of urine concentrate ability as well. The bloods we're going to do, urea, um, which will go up with volume depletion, so we need to couple that with our um, urinalysis. But urea and creatinine are the mainstay, the things we've looked at for years to tell us whether the kidneys are working. More recently, people have started talking about SDMA and there are a few studies, there's about half a dozen studies actually, looking at SDMA in renal insufficiency. And yes, we know that this value will increase before your urea and creatinine. There is evidence that it starts to go up um, when you've got about 25 to 30% of the kidney damaged. What is still lacking, despite what certain lab websites say, is the effect of other diseases on this measurement. So it has been put forward as a great uh, measure of renal function in hypothyroidism. 
There is not a single study looking at the effects of hyperthyroidism on your SDMA values. So it is an extra tool, it is not a standalone test. We don't know what inflammatory diseases do to um, the values, we don't know what protein losing diseases do to the values. So use it coupled with other tests rather than by itself. We do have a lot of advice calls about, oh, I've got an SDMA of 15 um, in a case with IBD. What does it mean? Well, actually, we don't know yet is the answer. We don't know if that's telling you anything about the kidney function. Other bloods that we'd like to do in a case that um, we're investigating for renal insufficiency are obviously the phosphate and the calcium, and ideally the ionized calcium, but I know in general practice it's not always... Um, possible to do that. We have quite a group of cats that actually have idiopathic hypercalcemia um, that come in um, with mild to moderate azotemia and that azotemia is actually secondary to their idiopathic hypercalcemia. So if we can look for that um, and treat it we can actually see an improvement in their renal function. But we also know that the calcium phosphate product will be altered with increased parathyroid activity in chronic kidney disease and we need to control that to stop the progression of the disease. Other things that we're going to talk about with regards to treatment, particularly the potassium, probably the most common reason that cats with iris stage 3 to 4 CKD get put to sleep is because they're not eating or because they're getting very thin. And reasons that they don't eat are often related to hypokalemia. So if we treat that and manage that, then we can actually find that these cats will live for longer because the owners don't put them to sleep because they don't have the concerns about the appetite. One of the first things we see with the low potassium is actually the appetite wanes before any neuromuscular weaknesses or anything else. I'm going to talk a little bit about PTH when we do a case later on. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the literature as to whether we should measure PTH, whether we should treat secondary renal hyperparathyroidism, there are specialists on both sides of the fence on this, so there is no, there are no hard and fast rules. I tend to leave it up to the owner. Um, I have treated, I've plenty of cats where I haven't treated, um, and as I say, there are arguments for and against treatment of hyperparathyroidism. Other things to measure the PCB, we know anemia is common in cats with CKD, and that that may need treated or managed um, in the disease process. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about that with treatment. And one thing that we can measure as well is the white blood cell count, and that can be important um, to see if we've got an infection. However, a normal white cell count and lack of neutrophilia does not rule out a urinary tract infection, particularly if it's in the lower urinary tract, um, because often you don't get an increase in your white cells. You won't get a temperature, so you'll have what's a silent UTI. The other thing that we need to look at is the urine. And a lot of the reason we're looking at this is for um, signs of other disease processes. So to diagnose CKD in the first place, we need to know what the urine specific gravity is. Who knows what the refractometer in your clinic measures up to? 1050. 1050. Anybody got a refractometer that measures above that? If you look at a normal healthy cat, what is its urine specific gravity? Above 1050. <laughs> yeah. So if you get a digital refractometer, you can measure up to about 1090. And a normal, healthy, young cat with fully functioning kidneys will have a USG of around about 1090. Which means for all of us in this room, it's off the top of the scale. If a cat gets acute kidney injury that doesn't put it into uh, sort of acute kidney failure type bracket where they're coming in sick but has damage to the kidneys and drops its USG from 1090 to 1060, are you going to see any clinical signs? No. If you're measuring its USG in the clinic, you're not going to see anything because it's still off the top of the scale. And that means that in the majority of cats, when the injury happens, we don't see anything which means it's incredibly hard to know what causes the kidney injury in the majority of <coughs> cases. So whilst we all use handheld refractometers, we're never going to know when that damage occurs. We start worrying 
when a cat's USG goes from 1040 to 1020. <coughs> the damage was six months ago when it went from 1090 to 1060. And it's just ongoing perpetuation um, of the inflammatory processes that have been set up by this point. So USG is incredibly important. However, we only look at a very small factor <coughs> of what's important with it. Dipsticks. Dipsticks are cheap, they're easy, they are made for humans. So many of the things on the dipstick we can't read. USG, the white cells, they're useless to us. What we're really looking for is whether we're seeing any blood there. We're getting maybe a slight idea of what the protein's doing, but we're really not going to... Um, look at that by itself we're going to want to know what the measurement is and we'll see if there's anything affecting the colometric scale so if we've got lots of urobilogen um, if we've got lots of bilirubin things that shouldn't be there the urine protein creatinine ratio we're going to talk about quite a lot how what this means why it's important and how we can alter it in cats um, with kidney disease because it's one thing that we know if cats are proteinuric they have got a markedly decreased survival compared to non-proteinuric cats. And the other thing that we need to do coupled with that always is a culture and sensitivity. I frequently will look at a sediment um, and look to see if there's white cells, as I said you can't trust the dipstick, look to see if there's any brown in motion, see if we're, if we're seeing any bacteria, so if we've got pyuria, um, or bacteria area. We know that if we take a cohort of cats with um, chronic kidney disease, between 17 and 22% of those cats will have a urinary tract infection. However, 8% of cats with urinary tract infection will have no changes on sediment exam. So we culture them. And we see whether we've got any infection because the best way to make a cat significantly better is to treat its UTI. So my own cat, who I've already mentioned, my old cat, um, Whiskey, when she was 16, she suddenly became very off colour. Um, didn't I went to work in the morning, she was in one place in the house, I came home at night, she was still in the same place. She was a hand-reared psycho um, that nobody else could handle, um, but she didn't get up for her food, and I said, okay, something's wrong. So I took her into the clinic, I did some bloods, her creatinine was 843. She had acute kidney injury. I don't know what caused it. She was an indoor-only cat. There was nothing in the house. There was no flowers, anything. But she got acute kidney injury. Um, she was in the hospital for a total of six weeks that I treated her. She did have the strangest, like, like vets, cats always do, the strangest findings. So um, she had a potassium level of 6.6, 6.7 despite IV fluids and diureasing her, four or five days after starting on fluids, she still had a potassium that was elevated. So she actually got tested for Addison's three times in her life, my cat. Um, but she got tested for Addison's at this point in time. She initially responded really well. Her urine creatinine came down and I'd started her on antibiotics. When I got my cultures back, which were negative, I stopped her antibiotics, and within 24 hours, her urea and creatinine shot back up. Restarted her antibiotics and didn't test again um, because we'd run out of veins and she was a psycho. Um, <laughs> and basically, she left the hospital with a creatinine of 800, and when I rechecked her urea and creatinine four months later, her creatinine was 220. The only thing that I'd done since going home was tried to give her subcut fluids and failed miserably and given her a course, three week course of antibiotics. The potassium, I suspect, was due to cellular apoptosis and necrosis going on from a kidney infection and she did have a lot of mineralization in her kidneys afterwards. So then she was a cat with CKD um, and much better figures than she had had initially. But we do see infections which don't always culture and quite often you'll get comments back from the lab of a single growth but it's a scant growth and they say it's not significant. We still don't know. We can get commensals that seem to live in the urinary tract that don't cause any problems but if you have a case that has 
kidney injury of any sort, I would always treat the infection that's there, just in case that's causing a problem. So as I've already alluded to, the majority of cases of CKD, we don't find a cause. We're looking at them down the line after the initial insult has left. If we look on the histop um, path, then we can see chronic interstitial nephritis in the vast majority of cases. Um, it's just an idiopathic intrinsic change that degenerative um, disease um, that we see. However, there are certain exceptions and things that we need to consider and be aware of. And this is a nine-year-old Persian cat that came in to me. She actually came in for HCM. She'd had kittens, um, but she had a long history of having been PUPD. Um, and we ultrasounded her kidneys and saw multiple cysts within the kidneys. We sent off PKD gene one, and it's pretty obvious she was going to be positive. She was positive for um, polycystic kidney disease. <coughs> this cat, the, you can't see the size of the kidney, but you can tell that, um, hopefully tell, it's quite hyper-echogenic. Um, it is enlarged. Um, it was a six centimeter kidney. Uh, there were both six centimeters in this cat. There is no corticomedullary definition. This cat had lymphoma in the kidneys. Um, and I, you will rarely hear me recommend biopsying kidneys. Um, occasionally in protein losing diseases, we might consider biopsy with EM. The time that I will consider doing something is in this disease. And actually, lymphoma in the kidneys sheds really easily, so we just need to find it aspirate them. So if you find a aspirate a kidney that's got um, this sort of appearance, you can find out whether it's got lymphoma in there or not um, and treat them accordingly. And ultimately, if we have a cat come in with either chronic or acute kidney injury, we want to see this. Because this cat has got a massively dilated renal pelvis. And hydronephrosis. The reason that is occurring is because there is an obstruction to flow within the lower urinary tract. And in the majority of cases, this is a stone lodged in the ureter. The other kidney may be the same, or it may be normal, or it may be small and shriveled up, um, and at that point dead. But if you can pick this up and pick it up early on in the disease process, we can place um, a bypass device um, called a sub so that the ureter is bypassed and the cats can survive really well. We know that within 24 hours of this occurring the GFR will drop by 75%. So the key with these is diagnose it quickly, treat it quickly. Unfortunately subs are expensive and if surgical options aren't possible for the client. The other thing we can do is try and treat them medically. I would say medical treatment probably has a successful outcome once in every eight cases that we see. Um, so obviously being a medic, we want to recommend medical treatment, but I would actually always recommend surgical treatment for these. Um, medical treatment, if we have to do it, is diuresis um, along with low dose amitriptyline because apart from being a tricyclic antidepressant, it also um, has an effect on the ureters and can alter peristals peristalsis within the ureters and sometimes clear these obstructions. However, unfortunately, they're not the majority of the cases we see. The majority are just our chronic um, degenerative kidneys, and we don't know why it occurs. The majority of clients, when they come in, their biggest questions are, why, what's happened to make my cat get CKD, and what's going to happen next, how long is my cat going to live. And when you first diagnose this condition, it's actually really hard to know. In answer to why, we don't know, it happened a long time ago. There is one hypothesis that it may be linked to vaccination. So. There is some science behind this. Normally, I get on my bandwagon and go, anti-vaxxers, no, no, no. But there is actually science behind this, and the research was done by a friend of mine. Um, 
cat vaccines are the only vaccines in any species that we deal with that are actually raised on feline Crandall Reese kidney cells. So we make cat vaccines that are on cat kidney <coughs> cells. Mm -hmm. And then we inject them into our cats. And this has been looked at a lot because one thing we know is that actually we over vaccinate cats. So there were several different areas of research going on at once. Firstly, when we vaccinate cats, how often do we have to do it? Because we still see caliche. I diagnosed a caliche today. Anybody else diagnosed a caliche in the last two months? Yeah, herpes. Seen a herpes cat or a snotty cat that probably is herpes? Yep. Okay, so those diseases are still out there. We've been vaccinating since the 70s, so why do we still see them? Um, at the moment, a local vet in Bristol is suffering from a lot of cases of new variant caliche. We don't want to see that in the clinic. It's horrible. In all the initial outbreaks, it killed one member of veterinary personnel's cat. It is going on. So we still see a lot of herpes and caliche. We don't see much panleukopenia. So a lot of people were starting to talk about what we're doing with these vaccines <coughs> and why we vaccinate. And it became clear that actually they do offer protection. Herpes is very hard because there's um, innate immunity as well as um, cell-mediated immunity and it's really hard to look at the antibody response because um, it's very variable between individuals. But if you do the challenge studies or if you look at the um, length of time you have antibodies to Panluc or Caliche, we can see that cats are protected for seven, eight years after their vaccination. It's about 80% of what it was one year afterwards. So we know that for our core vaccines, it, they last at least three years, provided you've had the initial course. And so Mike, it was actually Kat Lappin, who's a surgeon, who's married to Mike Lappin, who's an infectious disease specialist. And she suddenly said, is it a problem that cat vaccines are reared on cat kidney cells? And he was like, oh, I never thought about that. So he went away and did some research and he started looking for the different antibodies against proteins within the kidneys and some of them are present in vaccinated cats. Does that mean it causes kidney damage? We don't know. They do have lab cats um, <coughs> and one of the studies they did was to hypervaccinate cats and if you hypervaccinate cats with about 10 times the normal vaccine regime and very quickly post-mortem them you will see changes, inflammatory changes within the kidney and damage to the kidneys. However, that change seems to have disappeared by about three months after hypervaccinating. Now these are young cats that are getting 10 vaccines in a short period of time. What are we doing over a period of years? We don't know. So, the jury is still out. Yeah, there is some weak evidence that there is an effect, but how much that is in individual cats, which are vaccinated on an annual or triannual basis, we're not sure. But we certainly do see a lot of kidney disease. How long is my cat going to live? That's the other common question. And when we first diagnose it, it's very hard. But for several years now, we have had the iris staging system. It does help to give us an idea of potential treatments at different stages and potential prognosis. It really hit home to me when I went to a lecture by Jolie Lulich, and this is 12, 13 years ago. And he sat there and I just, you know, I've been a bad owner and I'd taken my cat home with her creatinine of 800 and left her at home thinking, well, she looks good. She's eating, she's drinking. I'm just going to leave her on her normal food. And as I say, try subcut fluids, which I failed miserably on because I lost her into the roof of the new house um, the second time I tried it, in which case I decided that probably wasn't a good idea. Um, and I was like, well, let's see how she goes. And I sat in the audience and I heard the statistics on iris stage four cats and that their expected life expectancy would be three to six months. But if you fed them a renal diet, you could double that. And I was like, well, I brought her home five months ago. Maybe I better change her food. <laughs> and at that point I changed her food 
And I lost whiskey, not of CKD, but of a multi-resistant E. coli infection at 19. Um, and she lived a long time. Now, as I say, when I d actually did bloods, her creatinine was down at 220, and she was no longer in iris stage 4. Um, but it did sort of hammer home the usefulness of this scheme. So, yes, we can put SDMA in here. Um, and really, that's uh, stage 1. Stage one is, do you have a isostenuric urine with normal creatinine? Or do you have signs or known renal damage? Or do you have an elevated SDMA? So basically, is there something to say this cat's kidneys are damaged, but they've got non-azotemic bloods? Typically, these cats are asymptomatic. They may have PUPD, but it's rare. Iris stage two is where we usually think about re-seeing cases more. We know that they have got isostenuric urine and their creatinine is falling into the 140 to 250 range. Now, many labs, this is still in normal. <coughs> Different labs vary, but they creatinine range normally goes to sort of 180, 220, something like that. So a lot of these cats are still falling just at the top end of normal, but they are considered to have iris stage 2 kidney disease. Mm. And again, they may or may not show signs of PUPD. Stage 3 and stage 4 is where we're really starting to see systemic signs. So any cat with a creatinine above 251, um, 440 is the top end of iris stage 3, above 440 is iris stage 4. And as I say, we expect these cats to be unwell. We also subclassify all of these groups according to the blood pressure and the urine protein creatinine ratio. And there's a lot of reasons why that's important. So, nephron. It's pretty, right? <laughs> So we've got aglomerulus here, which obviously is the most important functional component of our kidney. That is surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. Um, and the things that we really need to focus on, even if you don't focus on anything else on this slide, is the blood flow in and out of the glomerulus. So we have got our afferent arteriole here and our efferent arteriole here. Yes, they're surrounded by vascular smooth muscle cells. We've got... Um, our renal sympathetic nerves around them as well. We've got, um, we've put in the proximal convoluted tubule. You don't need to worry about that too much. You can think about the mesangial cells, mesangial matrix, but the most important bit that we're going to think about at the moment is the blood supply in, round, and out of that glomerulus. And to focus in on that, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, angiotensinogen is the starting particle that has few amino acids broken off becomes angiotensin 1. That is acted of, of that cleaving is performed by renin. And then we have um, our angiotensin converting enzyme that cleaves more amino acids off to make angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. That's one pathway. There are other pathways, and those pathways actually are most important in the kidney, although they do exist in other tissues. So the most important ones are the TPA, t tissue plasminogen activator pathway, and the chymase pathway. And they basically either bypass angiotensin converting enzyme or bypass renin in that conversion, which means we can be producing angiotensin 2 without angiotensin converting enzyme. And it happens, as I say, mostly in the kidney, and in the kidney it can have a paracrine effect. So apart from going around the whole system, it can also be produce locally and act locally. So why do we care about angiotensin 2? Well, angiotensin 2 binds to the AT1 receptors. And yes, there's effects on sodium and thirst and aldosterone and all those other things that we learn. But most importantly, binding to the AT1 receptors causes vasoconstriction. And if we look at the kidney, we have a lot more of these receptors in the efferent arteriole than in the afferent arteriole. So if we've got our um, afferent arteriole, glomerulus, efferent arteriole, and we've got, we've got to think about what the pressure is in the middle here. We've got two blood vessels, 
and then we produce more angiotensin II, which is going to bind preferentially here. So what we're going to do is put that pressure up across the glomerulus. Now in the short term situation, when we've got decreased blood flow to the kidney, that's great. That preserves the glomerular function. But in the long term situation, which happens when we start getting renal dysfunction, that is detrimental. We start getting damage to the capillaries um, in that glomerulus because we've got increased glomerular pressures. It will increase our single nephron GFR, and those effects will actually cause mechanical stress and damage to the kidney. It will <coughs> increase the amount of oxidative stress we've got, and it will increase the proteinuria. That calls in lots of our chemotactic factors, our increases our cell growth, it increases apoptosis. We know that if you put angiotensin II on a petri dish of feline, okay, they were cardiac mycites, but feline cells, you will see increased apoptosis and hypertrophy of those cells. So we know that this happens in cats. This isn't just in theory. This isn't in people. This is, is actually going on. We start getting macrophages infiltrating the kidneys, and those effects cause increased nephron loss, and that perpetuates the whole cycle. So short-term, angiotensin II, great. Long-term, very detrimental. What it does in the kidney by increasing that glomerular pressure is it starts to damage the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is so important in filtering the proteins. So we can get proteinuria for a lot of different reasons. It can be post-renal due to a UTI, hematuria. In people, we know it can be pre-renal, and we do have evidence of this in dogs, with dogs with hyperadrenal corticism, IBD, people with IBD will have pre-renal proteinuria. But in cats, it's usually post-renal or renal. And we know that the podocyte foot processes, which is where the protein is filtered, they won't let things through if they are bigger than about 70 kilodaltons. Now the main protein we're thinking about in the kidneys is albumin. Anybody remember the size of albumin? It's around about 69 to 70 kilodaltons, which means it could just about fit through those spaces between the podocyte foot processes. But basement membrane has a negative charge and albumin has a negative charge, which gives us something called a zeta potential, which means they repel each other. Damage to that membrane gets rid of that negative charge and albumin starts to leak through. The more damage, the bigger the spaces get as well. But we start to see proteinuria. So this is actually a nice sensitive <coughs> indicator for damage within the glomerulus. And we can look at it in cats. And people have looked at it a lot. And we know that if cats have a UPC above 0.4, we classify them as proteinuric. But back in 2006, we started looking at this and we realized that between 0.2 and 0.4 is a bad zone as well. And we call them borderline proteinuric, but frankly, I would treat these cats. And that comes from this study, which was performed um, by um, Hattie Syme, uh, the group at the um, RBC. And it looks at the effect of proteinuria on survival in cats. I need to say these cats have not all got CKD, but the majority do. I think it's about 86% have CKD because it's looking at proteinuria overall. But if we look at this 50% survival on these curves, the cats that are non-proteinuric have a 50% survival of over 1,000 days. If we take those with proteinuria, then we're seeing a 50% survival of around about 500 days. And those which we would classify as borderline proteinuric, we're seeing a 50% survival of about 550 days. So we know that proteinuria is very detrimental to survival. And proteinuria and hypertension are closely linked. 
We can have cats which are proteinuric due to hypertension. We can have cats which are proteinuric due to CKD. We can have all three things going on in an individual. Hypertension is obviously going to damage that little capillary meshwork that we've got in the glomerulus. Again, it's going to cause lots of similar changes. I don't want to spend too long on this bit, um, but basically it starts damaging the kidney in a very similar manner and we start to get protein leaking. So we substage according to the blood pressure and we're looking to see if the blood pressure is increased and if there's any effect on other organs. So if the blood pressure is not measured and we're iris staging, we actually need to say that it's not been done. You don't, if it's, you don't keep it the same as normal, you actually classify that cat as hypertension um, not um, looked for. If a cat has a blood pressure below 150, then they're not hypertensive. Some people say 140, but definitely around there. If they are between 150 and 180, they fall into this borderline hypertensive group, provided there are no other signs of end organ damage. If they're above 150 and they have signs of end organ damage, then they are classified as hypertension with complications. And if they are over 180 with no signs of extra renal complications, then they are classified as HNC, which is hypertensive with no complications. So basically 150, 180 are our cutoffs, and it depends whether there's something else going on or not. So a really similar graph to the last one. This is just cats with hypertension and proteinuria. And you can see that the survival is really similar. So these cats in this study were treated for their hypertension. Irrespective of that treatment, if the proteinuria wasn't dealt with, then they had a decreased survival time. So they may, they're well-controlled hypertensives. If they're not proteinuric, they're living for a thousand days. But if they're proteinuric, we're down to 350 or 550 days, depending whether it's borderline or beyond proteinuria. And that meant that we realised that these are things that we need to deal with when we're dealing with CKD cats. We need to look at what the blood pressure is, whether they're proteinuric, as well as dealing with their primary disease. So, how do we manage them? I used to quite often talk about cats with CKD in finals with the students. And you'd ask the final year student, what treatments do we have for CKD? And they'd sort of look at you a little bit blank and then often come up with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And that was it. And that's true. It's because we are so trained to think about drugs as our treatment option. But we have a huge arsenal of things that we can use for CKD because it's not just dealing with one thing, it's dealing with the whole systemic disease process and what's going on in these cats. And unfortunately it means very long consults with owners um, or sending them out to buy Sarah Caney's book which is excellent and I would highly recommend um, or nurse clinics. And to manage these cats we need to think first of all about what they're eating. As I've already said, you can double the survival of a cat with iris stage 4 CKD with diet. And we know that overall you'll increase the median survival time from 264 days to 633 days. Now, do you want your cat to live for nine months or two years? And yet we don't put it like that to owners. These di diets are so important in this disease. But people are worried cats won't eat them. Owners are worried cats won't eat them. I mean, a renal diet doesn't really sound the most appetizing thing. And then the old renal diets used to look pale and hard and disgusting. And no cat in their right mind wanted to eat them anyway because we were limiting or altering the protein in them. And that's the bit the cats want to eat. 
And if they don't eat, it's worse than them not eating a renal diet. Because if you can't maintain a body condition of about four to five out of nine, then they become catabolic and they start losing their um, muscle and that's worse for their kidneys and then their CKD will progress more rapidly. So most important thing is that they eat. The next most important thing is that they stay awake, that they eat renal diet. <coughs> so how do we get a cat to eat renal diet? We used to say mix it in slowly with its normal food. It's usually best to let them make their own mind up. Feed the cat a little tiny bit of renal diet next to their normal food. Slowly increase the amount of renal diet. If they don't like one, get another make. There's at least four good ones out there on the market. Go through them. If they won't eat 100% renal diet, it's better than nothing. But if you can slowly get them to go over. Some people say, oh, then it should be a wet renal diet. It's dry, you know, they need the water. There are many ways to get the water into them. Dry diet, if the cats are used to dry diet, they're not going to eat a wet diet. My cat, she was dried KD. She loved it. Another cat might not eat that. So it's just finding what's right for that individual. The diets, we used to say it was protein. Um, it's not just the protein. There are a lot of things going on in a diet. And if they won't eat the diet, we can actually start looking at those individual factors and trying to correct those. One reason that we have cats that don't want to eat is if you are azotemic, you start to get uremic gastritis, you can get stomatitis, and that stops cats wanting to eat. I will treat the majority of cats with CKD with either an H2 blocker, or PPI, um, plus or minus sucrapate. Personally, I like famotidine. It's once a day, it's easy to use, the efficacy has been debated both pro and con. Um, I find PPIs, unless you're going to start using lansoprazole or isoprazole liquid, um, need to be reformulated to get them down to cat size. So lamiprazole capsules are actually enteric coated, so we shouldn't just put them into gelatine capsules because we don't know if they're working or not. So. I like a once a day treatment, so I do tend to go with famotidine. The other thing we need to think about is the phosphate levels. And if they're particularly if they're not eating <coughs> a renal diet, but even if they are, but they've still got high phosphate, then phosphate binders are important. And when we're thinking about which phosphate binder we're going to use, we need to start thinking about what else we're going to do with this cat. What do these owners want? Do they want to try everything? Or do they want to try some things, but too many treatments is going to be not suitable for the cat or for them? Because if there's any chance that you might be putting this cat onto treatment for hyperparathyroidism, you need to be very careful what you put into the gut. Because both renal zim, when you can get it, and um, ipacotene contain calcium. And if you put calcium into the gut, and then you treat hyperparathyroidism, you're going to run into problems. So if there's a chance you're going to treat hyperparathyroidism, then you need to be using aluminium hydroxide as your phosphate binder. So Crowfate actually also has a mild phosphate binder effect if you do need to use that. But a lot of these cats end up with constipation, so sucrafate isn't ideal because it can worsen that. So it's looking at the whole picture and seeing what you need to do. The other thing that the diets have is they have omega-3 fatty acids added. I rarely add these separately um, because they are in the renal diet. If they really won't eat the renal diets, thinking about adding some fatty acids can be useful. Um, it's not known how much because nobody's separated the omega-3 fatty acids from the renal diets because they're added to all of them. So we don't know how much of an effect they have, but it seems that that may be part of the effect that the diets are having. 
that us also have added levels of B vitamins because we know these cats are diuresing, so they're losing their B vitamins. Again, nobody's looked at whether cats with CKD actually have low cobalamin. It's just there's no research out there on it, but they're added. <coughs> they probably won't do any harm, so. And then we get to our drugs. And we have two medications we can use, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers, or Symmetra. Um, we know that, as I've already said, cats with CKD that are proteinuric will die quicker. We also know from um, the Bonanza Pearl study um, that if you treat a cat with CKD and proteinuria, Bonazepril will increase the quality of life, it will increase the appetite. The only big trial that, that has been done like that was on Bonazepril. However, Symmetra has been shown to decrease the proteinuria to the same extent as Bonazepril. So we presume that it has the same effects. And I'm not going to stand here and say one treatment is better than the other. Cats might prefer a liquid medication. They might get on better with benazepril. Finances, they're both pretty expensive. Um, Telmasartan usually works out slightly more expensive. If you're treating proteinuria in a diabetic cat, then I would go Telmasartan because Telmasartan has effects on the NK1 receptors as well, a side effect of it, um, but it actually increases your um, insulin sensitivity. So it will decrease your requirement for insulin. It's a useful side effect. But in the majority of our CKD patients, there's actually very little effect. Oh, sorry, very little difference. The biggest difference that we know of is when it comes to blood pressure. And if we look at the effect on blood pressure of Symmetra compared to ACE inhibitors, Symmetra will usually decrease your blood pressure by about 30 millimeters of mercury, Benazepril by about 12. So, Neither is good enough by itself, but if you're combining it and you haven't quite got the effect that you want from your amlodipine, you might think about going for Symmetra above Benazepril. But it is very much case dependent, owner dependent, cat dependent. Other complications that we have to consider, anemia. I have seen more cats come into me with anemia that is severe, requiring blood transfusions due to misuse of erythro and darbopoietin than have ever needed to be given erythro or darbopoietin for CKD. So this is, it is possible. Many cats with CKD have anemia. Their PCB usually sits around 21% and it's an anemia of chronic disease. It doesn't need treated, they're not tachycardic, they don't have hyperdynamic pulses, they're not weak and feeble from their anemia. There are five, six reasons why you can see anemia in CKD cats. So I just said anemia of chronic disease should actually be known as anemia of inflammatory disease, which it can be an inflammatory disease process. We also know that you can get GI bleeding in CKD, far more common than having inappropriate levels of erythropoietin. Hyperparathyroidism can lead to bone marrow failure. We see hyperparathyroidism in 80% of cats with iris stage three CKD. You can get fragility of the red cell membranes in um, uremia, and so you get lysis of your red cells. Uremia leads to fibrosis um, and depletion of the bone marrow. You start lacking B12 because you're diuresing, and you'll get um, anemia from lack of B vitamins. It can go on. So erythropoietin, although it can be deficient and can lead to an anemia, I would never treat a cat with CKD with Darbo or erythropoietin without measuring it first. And good news is you can measure it at a CVS lab. Um, <laughs> nationwide um, specialist labs um, do run it. Um, and I would say always measure it first. Probably the biggest thing that owners can do at home other than the diet and the drugs is actually manage the dehydration. 
the average CKD Iris Stage 3 onwards cat will benefit from 150 mils of subcut fluids twice a week. Now, I've told many people you do this by sitting your cat down on your lap or at its food bowl, putting subcut fluids in and just letting it run through a bu burette from a bag strung up above the cat. Don't inject it, don't get the 50 mil syringe like we used to, inject it into the cat because that causes pressure and that's painful. As I've already said, I totally failed to do this with my cat. They too. She knew exactly what was coming and she was off up in the roof. It is very dependent on the cat. You can put in um, catheters, subcutaneous catheters, get some button ones or you can put in long ones. Um, put them in in some cases and they can be very good. They can be very useful and some cats tolerate them really well. But a lot of owners don't want anaesthetics, they don't want that done, and in many situations they can't manage to give subcut fluids at home. You can still increase the cat's water intake. So whiskey. Whiskey was a little princess, as I may have alluded to already. Whiskey didn't like the two slobbery golden retrievers, and she certainly did not like sharing their water bowl. Especially Sammy that kind of liked to rinse his whole mouth out in the water bowl. So Whiskey liked to drink out the glass beside my bed all the time. So Whiskey got given a glass of water beside her bed all the time. And she would drink a lot more. This is actually her bed in the background. She would drink a lot more if there was a glass of water beside her bed. Did I need to flavour the water with Whisk? No, I didn't. But you can flavour the water. Same as you would with an FLUTD cat. Make up your tuna ice cubes and flavour the water with it. It doesn't matter that they're getting a tiny bit of tuna juice when they've got CKD. Or a little bit of chicken broth and water. It's fine. Milk, maybe not quite so good, but anything that encourages them to drink. Manage your hypokalemia, because the hypokalemia will make them inappetent. Before cervical ventral flexion, before plantigrade stance, first thing you'll see is they go off their food. So manage that. If they have severe acidemia, then they may require um, some bicarbonate because we know that if you've got acidemia, it actually worsens the renal function. But we normally only do that if it's severe and ongoing. So very quickly, I want to do a case. Um, Lewis um, belonged to one of the nurses at the university that I worked with for a long time. And I knew him for a long time. Um, I actually used to do his vaccinations. And because I did his vaccinations, I noticed he only had a tiny murmur when he was four. Um, about a grade two systolic murmur right down on the um, sternum um, with no illness associated with it. It was dynamic. I wasn't concerned about it. Um, and otherwise, he was very, very well. However, when he was five, he came in um, unwell. And what Jen said was that he had st stopped eating um, really since the Friday. She brought him in on a Monday. Um, she'd noticed that his third eyelids were prolapsed and he'd had some diarrhea. He'd vomited twice over the weekend. He was very dull and lethargic. Um, and she didn't know what he was drinking, but he kept going out to the pond outside and drinking. And on physical exam, he was a very sick cat. So he still had his grade two out of six systolic murmur. He had a heart rate of 140 with a sinus arrhythmia. Now Lewis, he was, he was chilled, but he wasn't <coughs> that chilled in the cl clinic. So this is a cat in shock. Um, his respiratory rate was 36. His temperature was decreased at 36.3. His systolic blood pressure was measuring 90 millimeters of mercury. Now, blood pressure, as some of you will have heard me say before, is so important, whether it's high or low. We know that cats going into ICU on the day of admission into ICU, if they have a blood pressure below 120, their chance of survival to three weeks or to discharge from the hospital is significantly lower than cats with a blood pressure above 120. So we're always taught to think about hypertension,
but actually hypotension is also incredibly important. He was dehydrated, and as I said, he still had his murmur. So when he came in, I, I knew he was drinking <coughs> more, but this cat is in shock, is significantly unwell, and he could have many things wrong with him. So we started, we sent some bloods over to the lab, we got a urine sample. I did do, he had diarrhea, he had inappetence, he had third eyelid prolapse. We actually tested him for dysautonomia, which is why we did the Shermatier test and the Pelocarpine response test. He passed those beautifully um, with a normal response. Um, but when I got his bloods back that afternoon, his creatinine was 749. Um, chloride was 115, um, which was very slightly um, low. Our lab range was 117 to 121. Um, glucose was marginally elevated at 5.3, his phosphate was elevated at 4.92, and his urea was elevated at 56.9. His PCB at this point was 42.4, um, and his admin was 33.3. So he was clinically dehydrated. He had until this point been very well. Um, I had examined him the year before. He hadn't had bloods, but he had been perfectly well in himself. So at this point, I am going to presume this is an acute kidney injury. Like, well, why are you talking about it in a chronic kidney disease talk? But, oops. So his urinalysis, his USG was 1018. So despite being volume deplete, he could not concentrate his urine. He's, they didn't do us straightforward UPCs at the lab, but his UPC was 0.15, so it was not elevated, and his culture was negative. So we put Lewis onto fluids and famotidine and sucrophate. Now, how aggressive you are with fluid therapy and acute kidney injury is very debated fact. I tend to be relatively aggressive. Some people say, say you don't need to be. Um, you can argue it both ways. I tend to be aggressive with the fluid therapy. Um, he got famotidine and sucralfate, and as his potassium dropped, <coughs> he got potassium supplementation. <coughs> he was started on a low phosphate diet, and he was given phosphate binders. In fact, he got um, B vitamin supplementation in his fluids as well, because Jen came to me in tears going, my cat's got the yellow fluids, does that mean he's going to die? Because apparently yellow fluids equals death in cats when I put combivit in the fluids. Um, I was like, no, that's just B vitamins. He responded really quite well. Within a couple of days, his creatinine had dropped down to 479. His albumin had dropped down to 26.3. Um, so we'd sorted out his volume depletion. Um, his PCV had come down to 25.2. Um, his urea was still 31. And he stabilised at around about that level. So at this point, we would say he was an Irish stage four. However, he hasn't been stable and hydrated for two weeks. So at this point, we cannot classify him according to the iris scheme. He went home. He was eating KD. Um, he was bright. He was rehydrated. His blood pressure had stabilized about 130, and we said, we'll check him back in a week. So two weeks later, he came in and his creatinine was down to 370, so we're still seeing a decrease. So again, the iris staging system for CKD, we can't use. There is an acute kidney injury. Um, his albumin was down to 26, his rear was 31.8, and he started to develop a mild anemia. His PCB was 21.2, and at this point, his UPC had gone up to 0 0.64. Does anybody want to do anything else with Lewis at this point? Good. So the UPC is 0.64, but he has had acute kidney injury. And ACE inhibitors and angiotensin 2 receptor blockers shouldn't be used in acute kidney injury. A lot of people at this point are like, I want to treat that. And we stood there and we thought about it because he's, you know, we're now, what, three weeks from the initial insult? He's not chronic yet by any means, but he should be starting to adapt to the changes in his kidney. Should we be inhibiting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? We know in the acute phase it's detrimental. 
And when I did talk to her about it, and I said, look, we could do this, but we might actually make his renal function decline. At the moment, he's clinically well. Let's revisit this when we know how chronic he is down the line. And she stood there and she said, I don't want to kill my cat. So yes, that's what we did. However, two weeks later, he represented mm -hmm. dull. He had uremic ulceration. He was dehydrated. He'd lost weight. Um, his blood pressure was holding at 120. And I'll be honest, at this point, some people started saying, Kerry, you're fighting a losing battle. Put him to sleep. Once they've got uremic ulceration, they're never going to do well. That's what they said. I'm not one for listening. I wanted to know why he'd gone downhill. So we did bloods and we did urinalysis. And in the meantime, I gave him buprenorphine orally. I gave him Sinulox, palatable drops orally. I don't know if they have an effect on the urine pulses, but it makes me feel better. He started eating as soon as he had some pain relief. He was clinically dehydrated. Yet on his bloods, his creatinine was 442. His albumin had gone up to 25.8, and his PCV had gone up to 28.4%. So that creatinine does not represent any change in his renal function from those two weeks ago. 370 to 440 when your volume deplete, that's not a deterioration in renal function. So what else could be making Lewis sick now? UTI? Yeah. 20% of cats with renal insufficiency are going to have a UTI. Now, your culture is going to take a week to come back, um, or in Lewis's case, 24 hours to come back because it was hooching. Um, but even that day, I knew his UPC had shot up to 1.44. So we've got evidence that we have got something else going on. And so we treated him. Overnight fluids, antibiotics, and <coughs> we continued on his sucralfate famotidine, sorry, phosphate <coughs> binders. And I actually gave him tumor K because he hated Kaminox. And I stood and I talked to Jen and I said, look, what do you want? And she said, I don't want to keep him in the hospital over the weekend. It's a Friday night. I'm going to take him home. I said, do you want me to check his parathyroid hormone and see if there's any other medical management that we can give him? And she said, yeah, let's do it. I said, well, it's going to take three weeks to come back. And at this rate, he is not going to be alive in three weeks time. She said, well, it's covered on the insurance, so let's send it off anyway. PTH is expensive to check. And I took it, and we sent it away, and his was markedly elevated at 127. Normal being up to 23. And they say if you're, depending who you read, but four or five times the normal level, it is beneficial to treat. And then there's a million different treatment protocols because nobody really knows what works and what doesn't. So I talked to her about <coughs> Casatrol um, and starting Casatrol without even getting the PTH back because I didn't think he was going to survive very long. And he went home with subcut fluids and instructions to come back and see me on the Monday. And she didn't bring him in. And she didn't bring him in. And I was like, Jen, what's going on? And she was like, well, he seems well, so we're just not talking about it. I said, okay. He did really well. Um, we got the cast trial back. He was still clinically well. I'm oh, sorry, the PTH back. And I started him on cast trial. I started him on the high dose cast trial. Um, you'll find there's low dose, there's high dose pulse, there's all sorts of different protocols. Um, and I didn't really explain to her what I expected it to do. I just said, this can make some cats feel better. There is no point in measuring the PTH after starting because it doesn't go down. So we're never really sure what it does. But you just keep an eye on the calcium and phosphate and make sure that they stay in normal limits. And she actually said to me, she said, days that he gets that oil, because <laughs> I mix up calcium and veggie oil, days he gets that oil, he eats well. 
and if he doesn't get it, he doesn't eat. And it, that is actually what most owners report. It's not that it decreases the PTH. They seem to eat on calcitriol, and I don't know why. <coughs> Nobody really understands what is going on. But people that use it, although we can't explain the mechanism, do think that it makes cats feel better. So I will use it in people that want to give it a try. Lewis gained weight. He was bright and well. He was running around. It was my perfect finals um, cat for exams because he looked beautiful, shiny coat, body condition score of five out of nine. Um, but he had a creatinine of 240, a PCB of 21, a urea of 18. And when you palpated his abdomen, his kidneys had become small and slightly nodular. And his UPC leveled out at about 0.6. And after three months of a UPC of 0.6, then we started him on um, Symmetra. And then the little blighter went out and played in the road and got squished. But he felt well until that day. So, happy ending, Nor. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, thank you for coming, everyone, and uh, get home safe. And probably finish the buffet on your way out, please. <laughs>